all for uh, showing up. Um, real quick, I want to thank everybody who's participating in the conference. It's been a great two days. Um, we've had some great papers, some great conversations. Uh, all of you that showed up, thank you very much. We appreciate it uh, dearly. Um, this is it. We're going to close it out with our talk here tonight. Um, there will be some snacks afterwards if you're interested. There will be some cookies and fruit and vegetables. So if you want to be healthy, have your choice. Um, and on that note, I'm going to allow our uh, Vice President, Joan Costello, to introduce our keynote. And I want one more time thank you all for everything you've done. So. I want to start by welcoming all of you and by giving the regrets of the President. He really regrets not being here. We're in the middle of a search for a uh, Vice President for Student Affairs. And right after that, he's committed to a strategic planning session in one of the southern suburbs with the major mayor and the council, you know, all those people. So he really regrets not being able to be here. And to say to you also, thank you for coming. And we're really pleased that uh, you have been supportive of the conference. It is really my uh, pleasure to be here now doing this introductory speech. Uh, I was glad, actually, that uh, Tim uh, couldn't come because then it gave me the opportunity to uh, meet Dr. Troyer and also uh, to be with you and to uh, hear what he has to say. Uh, Dr. Anton Troyer is a professor of Ojibwe at Bemidji State University. He has a BA from Princeton and an MA and a PhD from the University of Minnesota. He is editor of the Ashkana, oops, Ashkabewis, did I go do it? Ashkabewis, I want to say Ashkanabi, don't I? I <laughs> Ashkabewis, native journal, the only academic journal of the Ojibwe language, and author of nine books, including Everything You Wanted to Know About Indians But Were Afraid to Ask, Ojibwe in Minnesota, and Living Our Language, Ojibwe Tales and Oral Histories. Dr. Troyer has sat on many organizational boards, including the White Earth Land Recovery Project and the Minnesota State Board's Board of Art, Arts Board. He has received more than 40 prestigious awards and fellowships from many organizations, including the National Endowment for the Humanities and the MacArthur Foundation. Today, he will talk with us about flourishing in the world of disasters and the indigenous perspective on historical trauma. It is my great pleasure to bring for you Dr. Troy. Hi, <laughs> Ninisoto Tago now with your boy, Gawi. English. They said, they said they wanted me to speak about language, but they didn't say I had to do it in English. I suppose it's a good thing I asked now rather than at the end of my talk. No, I say that a little tongue in cheek. I kind of expected as much. Although I do often tell the deans and the president at my institution that if anyone calls and asks for the Department of Foreign Languages, to be sure to direct them to the English department. Um, I, I really am pleased to be here, and I've been here for uh, all of yesterday and today, and listened to the student papers and the grad students, and I am impressed with with all of you. You know, not only the fact that students are turning out and showing up, but they're really engaged and asking great questions, and so uh, you know, I think that speaks really well for the students and the staff and everyone who's really worked so hard on this, uh, on this conference. So it's an honor for me to be here in such good company. And uh, I want to do this informally. Feel free to ask some questions as we go along, although I'll leave time for it at the end. By the way, I intentionally pack lots of stuff into my PowerPoint, knowing there's no way I'll be able to really give each part all the time and attention it deserves. But I'm happy to share that PowerPoint with anyone who wants it. If you have a jump drive, I'll give it to you now, or I'll email it to you if you leave your contact information. There's also free handouts in the back there about publications and programs, and feel free to grab those. The books are for sale, but, uh, but all the flyers and stuff are for free. Uh, I guess maybe I could start just by telling you that 
Uh, where I work at Bemidji State University, we have really quite a few native students, uh, numbering in the hundreds, which is probably different than most of the other Minsky uh, institutions in Minnesota. And every year we were trying to figure out the best ways to, you know, not only recruit students, but really retain them. You might be aware we got some issues in Indian country with education, and that's one of the subjects I'm really going to focus on today. But uh, so we're having a, a you know a big banquet to honor our graduating seniors, academic accomplishments for our native students. And most years they were bringing in somebody you know like a politician, uh, maybe a tribal politician, maybe an academic person. And I said, why don't we do things differently? Let's bring in somebody who has a PhD in the School of Life but can speak to the importance of our language, culture, who could really, uh, that our students could really resonate with and understand in their experience going through this world, but who can also talk about the importance of, you know, education and so forth. I said, okay, that's fine, who do you got in mind? I said, well, how about Tom Stilding? He's, uh, he's a medicine man from Panema, uh, which is really a special community on the Red Lake Reservation. Uh, nobody there's ever been baptized. There's never been a, a successful missionary movement. It's a very traditional community. Uh, lots of people still uh, practice traditional life ways there. Uh, and he kind of, you know, grew up and was raising his children in this community. But he was also the first person named chaplain for the Minnesota State Senate who was not of a Judeo-Christian background. So I said, he'll have some really interesting things to say. And right away, Tom broke every rule for a graduation banquet speech, which should be short, a couple good jokes, focus on the students. So he talked for about an hour and a half. He did it all in Ojibwe. He said one thing when he was all done, which I thought was really uh, telling. He said, all you people who study Indians, study that. And he went and sat down. <laughs> I was highly entertained. But I think it made an important point, too. You know, how many not just hundreds, but thousands of books have been written about indigenous people without a single conversation with indigenous people, without any understanding of the languages, culture, histories of those people from their own perspective. I mean, you wouldn't dream of writing a book on German history without going to Germany, speaking fluent German, researching in the German archives, and the French and English ones too. But lots of people have built careers on writing about Native people based on archival research, which is other non-Native people writing in their journals, army officers or missionaries, about the Native people. But holy man, there's something really wrong with that. There really is. And I think when you really look at the whole span of what we do with education, especially in relation to, well, to really to any people of color in this country, but especially with, uh, with Native people, experience in education, it is a disaster from just about every way you want to look at it. So this is some of what's on my mind. I am going to be talking quite a bit about the importance of tribal languages and kind of give you a better sense for where we're at with tribal languages and some of the really exciting and inspiring stuff going on to revitalize them as well. But I want to kind of first start by looking at some of the big picture stuff. And, uh, and I'm hoping you'll find some things that'll challenge some of your conventional thinking about this stuff. One of the things that, that I'd like to share with you, and this might be uh, an interesting mantra to start with, but it's hard to be white. <laughs> Indians usually laugh uproariously when I say that. But if you look at the history of white people in this world, one of the things, I mean, most people are at least vaguely aware, even if they don't understand the depths of the historical experience of Native people, that some bad stuff went down, right? They're aware that there was a history of slavery in this country. You know, some of these big items are, are on people's radar screen. And so there's this tendency to say, you know, oh, the poor Indians, or the poor fill in the blank, uh, with whoever might have suffered uh, throughout history. But one of the first places I wanted to start with is White people are victims of genocide, too. And if you look at the history of Western Europe, for example, there was a time 
when there were earth-based cultural perspectives and earth-based religions, which dominated the thinking and belief systems of people in Europe. They were successfully obliterated. And it didn't go down without resistance. There was both a concerted effort at colonizing white people internally within Western Europe, and then co-opting what remained the vestigial remnants of you know, earth-based religious beliefs and so forth. Even something like Easter, there were pagan holidays in the spring solstice, and it's kind of weird if you look at, really look at when Easter gets scheduled, it was intentionally designed by those running the Catholic Church to coincide exactly on that pagan holiday so that the desire of unbelievers to celebrate at that particular time could be more easily bent towards Catholicism. It was carefully orchestrated. So it falls on the first Sunday after the first full moon after spring. Sometimes people aren't even aware of that. But in any event, if you look at a lot of the structures that we still have today, you know, we've, most people are aware of the history of the Roman Empire. It's 500 years. Although I think you could make a pretty compelling case that the history of the Roman Empire has been over 2,000 years. Even the structure of many of our governments today are based off of a Roman Senate, are based off of, uh, you know, a religion that the Romans very successfully and carefully co-opted and built into their own with the Roman Catholic Church and pretty much every other variation of Christianity is a spin-off of that somehow. Even what we do in education, the structure and style of our educational institutions, your cap and gown, it's all from Roman times. And sometimes we've been so successfully assimilated that we don't even see this as something outside of our perceived cultural perspective on the world. So that's one of the things. When you talk about genocide, there are a lot of ways to talk about it. And sometimes the events, the disasters, the, the real catastrophes of genocidal experience leave deep impressions, not just on culture or language, but on the human psyche. I'm sure you're pretty aware that, you know, post-traumatic stress or something like that can have a really profound effect on somebody. But there's been a lot of interesting thinking and writing about how tra trauma, historical trauma, can not just affect one person or their individual psyche, but can really cause patterns of thinking, believing, and acting that then affect the next generation and the next, and the next. So that even when some traumatic event is no longer within the living memory of a person, as it happened generations before, the effects of that experience are. So yeah, white people are victims of genocide too. And I honestly believe that the way we relate to the earth the culture of violence, which I think most people are pretty well aware of, can be directly tied to the historical trauma of white people. That's not to say that there isn't historical trauma for everybody else. There are, and some of it's been horrific. But you look at some of the belief systems and structures that came out of you know, Roman times, ideas about slavery. And regardless of who is being enslaved, just the idea that another human being could be owned and enslaved is a pretty, pretty amazing idea. Not amazing in the good sense, but astounding that people could hold such an idea. But that was one of the underlying structures for a lot of really ugly history. In fact, you know, when you look in a deeper philosophical sense, and I really want to have time to lay all of this out, you really get to the point where a human being becomes an it, a thing, rather than a being. And so too with other creatures.
creatures on this planet. And the real danger of thinking of somebody as an it, as an other, is that you disassociate yourself from, from really valuing all those it's, even in the way we talk about and therefore the way we think about them. It makes it a lot easier to exploit the resources without thinking about the consequences, whether those be natural resources or human resources. With me so far? Yeah. In fact, you know, when you look at Christopher Columbus, for example, arriving and, you know, I'm an Indian and these are Indians, uh, and, and that early encounter, you know, a lot of people focus on the label and the misnomer that was then applied to indigenous people, but probably the most profound thing about it was that he looked at other human beings and didn't say, oh, there are other human beings here. There's an it. There's an other. And with 50 men, we could subjugate this island, send the inhabitants to Castile to be slaves, or make them do whatever we want. I think that was the more troubling development. And it wasn't just an event, but it was a colonial ideology which affected all kinds of history for hundreds of years and still affects us today. All right. So, you know, historical trauma has this many, many effects. <laughs> Among them, a lot of fear, a lot of anger. Sometimes people walk around being angry and don't even know what the heck they're being angry about. They just know that they're angry. Well, you can see a lot of examples of that in our society, regardless of race. A culture of violence, directed inward, directed outward. Disconnection from and devaluing of the natural world, and, I don't know, displaced loyalties, isms, for lack of a better word, nationalism. And that's not to say that there's nothing to be proud of or happy about, but pride can be very dangerous too. Nationalism can be very dangerous too. And I suppose nobody would argue with the nationalism behind the Nazis, the national socialism, right? All those isms, sexism, racism. So I think a lot of this is tied to that historical trauma. All right. Anyone ever taken a clinic or really done some reading about something called white privilege? A lot of people really bristle at even hearing the subject. They're like, I'm white and I certainly don't feel privileged. It seems like everybody else is getting a scholarship, a leg up, an affirmative action, a policy that's going to keep me down. I don't get it. I'm not privileged. But the privileges are so built in that you don't even see them. So there are things like little things, like being able to go into a drugstore and buy a Band-Aid, a flesh-colored Band-Aid that more or less matches the color of your skin. Yeah, I made one for me. It means that you know you can walk into any hairstylist or barber shop and they're gonna know how to cut your hair. Little privileges. They're really privileges we should all enjoy. We should all be so privileged. It's not bad, except that they're not extended to everybody. And sometimes they get to like things that are a little fuzzier or harder to see. Like if you get pulled over by the police and you're white, you can be pretty sure that you were pulled over because you had a broken taillight or you were speeding or you didn't use your turn signal. But if you're a person of color, you can never be 100% sure that it wasn't something else. Especially if you're driving around with tribal license plates or something like that. So that's a little privilege that we should all enjoy. And that's what's kind of meant by some of this racial privilege. Or you can go into a bar in St. Paul and see, you know, 300 inebriated college co-eds. All of them white and think, huh, ah, nothing. You wouldn't think white people have a problem with alcohol. 
But you can see 300 inebriated white college co-eds and one Indian. And someone's going to say, Indian's got a problem with alcohol. It's pretty amazing. So it is the privilege of white people not to have their actions be the register upon which their entire race is evaluated. There are a lot of these. If you're interested in the subject, I'm not going to spend much more time on it, but Peggy McIntosh and others have done a lot of writing. There are articles available for free if you just Google them and stuff like that. Pretty interesting. But, you know, privileges extend to other things. By the way, language is another big one. Right? Like you can operate in English, and it doesn't matter if you actually own a house in Costa Rica, you can still operate exclusively in English without any regard to the mother tongue of that country and get it by just fine. You can travel just about anywhere in Europe operating in your language and expect everybody to make the accommodations to you. You can go on safari in Africa and operate in English, but a Frenchman or someone from Kenya or Costa Rica who comes here, they don't get those same privileges. Having privileges isn't so hard, but losing them is. And if you look at South Africa, for example, you could see a small white minority that really went to an extreme to preserve white privilege. An unhealthy one that I think most people, regardless of their race, had a problem with. Right? If you're familiar with the history of apartheid in South Africa. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it took a lot to dismantle that. Massive punitive sanctions from every major economy in the world. And it took a long time still to change that. So sometimes people resist the systems that give them privilege. It's easier to pretend that they don't exist. Or to even label it as something else. Push back. In a very extreme case, you know, something like the Nazi Holocaust. I think it would be hard for us to have another, like, Nazi-type Holocaust here. I think it would even be hard to go all the way to apartheid extremes, but we are seeing a lot of pushback on this subject. Are you familiar with this Arizona law, 15-112? It banned the teaching of ethnic studies in Arizona. And there was one particular program, a Hispanic program, uh, Hispanic Studies program in Tucson that was targeted. And so they were forced to dismantle the program, the books. And the, by the way, the books that were confiscated and locked up in the storage facility for the public school district included a book called Rethinking Columbus. So it wasn't just Hispanic stuff, but all kinds of stuff. And it raised some really fundamental issues that hasn't gone all the way through court systems and all that stuff. You know, it seems like a fundamental challenge to freedom of speech, right? There are even inherent contradictions within the own, its own law. It says you cannot have a program that is designed specifically for students of one racial or ethnic group. But if you take ethnicity out of the schools, why does it race too? And what kind of world do we want to prepare our children for? Some fantasy land? Or the world that's actually going to be here? One in which a lot of people will speak Spanish. It's just a tremendous disservice to the students. But things like this, or efforts to pass official English language declarations, I think speak to the same sentiment behind something like apartheid, to preserve <coughs> privileges for a few. And by the way, you know, even Minnesota, home of Scandinavian Lutherans, is projected to have a white minority population after 2040. So the erosion of English language privilege and the erosion of English culture privilege 
is seen by many as the disintegration of our society. And something like an official language declaration is seen as a way to preserve what's good and important, what unites us. They'll we'll coach it that way. But to me, this speaks to a much more fundamental effort to preserve privilege for a soon-to-be minority population. By the way, when the first time I went to the Democratic Precinct Caucuses, my neighbor was there, and this is a guy I worked for for years. His name was Albert Swenson. And uh, I was a field hand, you know, lifting hay bales and stuff like that. And he was there caucusing in the Norwegian language with a bunch of other Norwegian farmers. That was perfectly American. It was quintessentially Minnesota. So, it is not language which unites us. But core values about humanity or respect for and tolerance of things like cultural and linguistic diversity, that should unite us. And there's nothing that the Founding Fathers, not that they're infallible either, put in the Constitution about language. All of this official language, English language declaration stuff is new. It's brand new. And I think it's really dangerous. And the increasing polarization of our society, I think, is increasingly dangerous. It makes you wonder, how much diversity can a democracy really tolerate? It's a great question. And it doesn't have an easy answer. And people point to you know, countries that have a more socialist structure, Norway or something like that, and they've been functioning pretty darn well as a way to kind of level the playing field economically and so forth, but they have yet to be really challenged by diversity. And other socialist countries like Austria and France have more recently been challenged with a lot of diversity, and it's been really ugly. like traditional guard for Muslim women outlawed in France and things like that. I think you gotta, we got to really think critically about where we're going and what it's saying. All right, this is some of the big picture stuff, and I'm going to be coming back to it, but I'd like to, there's no time to kind of give you all of Indian Studies 101 in one one-hour lecture, but I figured I'd pick one example of the historical trauma piece for Native people that's going to touch on language, culture, and education, and hopefully illuminate some of this stuff. There was a guy named uh, Captain Richard Henry Pratt back in the 1800s, and he was really the architect for America's Indian education policy. He's quite famous for saying this, our goal is to kill the Indian in order to save the man. And what he really meant by that was, if we assimilate Native people, we will be giving them the greatest favor in the world. They don't even know it yet. Because those sons of the forest don't understand. But we will teach them. And in so doing, we'll be giving a piece of sweet American apple pie to all of those savages. And that was really the line of thinking. So, you know, at least he thought Indians had souls and stuff like that, and they were worth saving, and this would be the means to do it. The real problem, by the way, his argument won out. Uh, they created the Carlisle Indian Industrial School in Pennsylvania, started in 1879. <coughs> One of the things that really differentiates the Native American experience in education is that their experience was not one of so much of being given an education as much as it was one of taking away tribal culture. Now, we're going to draw some connections to where we're at today. But this is one thing that makes, you know, I guess I should back up and say there are lots of groups that underperform according to state mandated testing guidelines. Hispanics, blacks, and so forth. But I think for black Americans, education was seen as an opportunity that was unfairly denied. 
right? From 19th century stuff. Don't want people writing their freedom papers and whatnot. So it was denied. For native people, education was a tool used to assimilate. And that was the first introduction. And sometimes you have a different reaction, whether something's being forced on you or withheld from you. There are problems both ways. But it's something that is different about the, the native experience. Carlisle was an old military uh, fort and training ground for a US servicemen. It was converted into a school, and the school was truly industrial, right? People worked half the day, went to school half the day. And the industrial side was rough, like digging ditches, starting at age six. And so they were preparing what they believed. They were preparing native people for a future in which they would obtain gainful employment. Boys as manual laborers, girls as domestic servants. Right? And that was what the, the thinking was. <coughs> Picture's a little fuzzy. There's Carlisle. 58 different tribes represented. Thousands of children. By the end of the 1800s, they were enrolling 20,000 kids, new kids, every year in the system. Incredible. And it was about assimilation. This is the same person. Before and after. Year one. And it's just a physical makeover. By the way, I mean, there's so many things to talk about, and I know in the interest of time, I'm gonna, gonna keep things moving along here, but you know, in Ojibwe culture, for example, hair is seen as a symbol of spiritual strength. Like one of our elders, Leonard Moose, said, it's like your medicine. So if you cut your hair, it's like your medicine will leak out. So when we were a kid, if we had a haircut, they'd take the end of your braid after they cut your hair and they'd graze it on a hot rock to like cauterize the wound in your hair. To seal, to seal it, to keep your medicine in. So these kids got stripped away, and often at a very early age, age six, and the schools were residential, so the kids were sent there to live, pulled out of their home community from everything they knew, speaking only their tribal languages, and day one, there goes the hair. Kids were sent with medicine bundles, things to protect them and keep them safe, burned in a fire right away on day one with the physical makeover. And the schools were residential intentionally. It wasn't just because America is part of, you know, the British colonial experience and they liked residential boarding schools. That was part of it. But it was also because uh, they believed that it was really important to separate children from their home communities, home culture, language, from their parents, from anything that would drag them down or backwards. Well, so haircuts, traditional clothes discarded, they're given military uniforms, marching to and from class, harsh physical punishments for the speaking of tribal languages, the only languages that they knew. The system was compulsory. Kids had to go to school. So they were forcibly removed from the home. No limited parental contact. And there's a woman named Brenda Child who teaches at the University of Minnesota who wrote a book called Boarding School Seasons which is based primarily upon letters at Carlisle. Letters sent by students to parents and by parents to students which were not delivered. Just the fact that the communication was not delivered says something. The schools were often far from home, so it would be hard to run away. During the summer months, because they had this agricultural calendar that we still have in our educational institutions today, and they would find non-native families willing to foster these native kids after they'd had a good makeover. Parents and extended family members completely disempowered. And this was during the height of disempowerment for native people, right? 
The U.S. government sent Indian agents to control and micromanage reservations. There's been a lot of change since the Indian agents came off the reservations and tribal <laughs> leadership could assume control over reservations again. That didn't happen until the 1930s. After school, kids are being pressured to find worker habitation away from reservations. But the people who designed this, this policy, guys like Captain Richard Henry Pratt, they didn't think very deeply or long term about this. Hello, this was America, it was the end of the 1800s, and there was a racial barrier to gainful employment for people of color. We didn't really even address that until the 1960s, and then you could make a pretty convincing argument that did, we have yet to really successfully address that completely today. So those promised economic opportunities just did not materialize. So what did people do? Drifted back home? Sometimes kids had been away from age 6 to age 18, could not even speak the same language as their own parents. Sometimes didn't recognize their own parents. They were assimilated, but at what price? By the way, there are studies today that are saying we have to reform, and we are in the process of reforming the way that we do boot camp for adults in the modern military, because harsh physical conditions, getting sworn at and yelled at all the time, just doesn't produce great psychological results, right? So we're in the process of reforming that. That's for adults who volunteer and get paid and great benefits. What happens when that happens to a six-year-old child? And how does somebody learn how to parent? But by how they are parented. So what happens when you have one, two, three generations in a family who are educated and raised with lots of harsh physical punishment and no nurture? Puts a big tear in the social fabric. Substance abuse issues in Indian country, they're real. And they really are directly connected to U.S. government policy. Not just the, hey, here's a bottle of whiskey, come sign this treaty stuff. But by this big tear that the U.S. government intentionally and consistently put into the very fabric of Native communities. And this is the issue with historical trauma. If you take a hammer and you're pounding someone in the back of the head, and then you stop and put down the hammer, it's not sufficient to say, why don't you get up and quit being so mad? Nobody's hitting you in the head with a hammer anymore. That all happened in the past. Why don't you just forget about it? Because there's this huge, horrible, gaping wound that has yet to heal. And this is really at the base of the troubled relationship between Native communities and the United States government. There's this huge wound. Pine Ridge, for example, has an 85% unemployment rate. 85! 85! <clears throat> I mean, when the unemployment rate in America reached 15%, we called it the Great Depression. And what an intervention we had. It completely changed public policy. We have a social security system, you know, Tennessee Valley Authority, all kinds of stuff. Even in the most recent recession, major government bailouts and interventions. Pine Ridge is waiting for its intervention. The Great Depression, it started when the white man showed up and it has yet to end. So, when someone says, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps, why are Indians so angry all the time? Why don't they pick up the trash in their yards? Native people are like, you just don't understand. And that's the ones who are polite enough to say it that way. Well, I'm going to kind of breeze through some of this stuff. But uh, there's a lot of good information out there, books, education for assimilation, 
uh, and so forth. And I've got a lot of those resources tagged in the PowerPoint if you want to get copies later. There were schools put up all over the place. Eventually the government had 25 different schools in operation. Uh, they were enrolling, as I mentioned before, 20,000 new students every year. It was a big deal. Um, kids had to go to school. It didn't have to be one of the government-run residential boarding schools. They could also be sent to another bona fide educational institution, most of which were run by missionary organizations. A similar industrial model, usually. Similar harsh physical punishments for speaking of tribal languages. And by the way, widely reported sexual molestation of children who attended there. And by the way, Canada has, just in the past, over the past several years, issued a formal apology for its residential boarding school um, system, and also created a system by which people could uh, be paid for abuses suffered. And as a result, they have reams and reams of testimony and statistics about the numbers of people who were sexually abused in government-run schools as opposed to church-run schools uh, about the harsh physical punishments. Because basically, and this is one of the issues that some people have with it, it just quantifies the pain. Right? you got to do something, but not everybody's happy with it. Some people say, hey, what I endured is more than a number. It's more than a check for $5,000 or whatever it might be. But this is real and widely reported and easy to find. And if you look, especially with, through the Canadian websites, there's a lot of information freely available to the public about it. The schools eventually started to change because they got bad reputations. There was a worldwide influenza epidemic in 1918, killed a lot of people <coughs> across the whole planet. Uh, but it was especially devastating at the schools. By the way, the schools kept cemeteries. I don't know how many of you could imagine sending your children to school and never even getting their body back, but that is exactly what happened. Carlisle and Haskell each buried over 300 children one year. Incredible. Over half of the kids had trachoma, which is a painful eye disease, and it's easily prevented simply by good hygiene. This is what happens when you have six-year-old kids digging ditches for half the day. Tuberculosis was rampant, poor diet, widely reported, and eventually Carlisle was closed in 1918 because of the beginnings of a public outcry. There was a major report issued in 1928, and this was on everything in Indian Affairs, this big 900 page report. Uh, but Amazingly, it's one of the very few documents commissioned by the United States government that officially criticized the United States government. And it just blasted Indian policy for, especially for the school systems, issues of poor nutrition, poor health care, insufficient clothing, exceedingly harsh physical punishment, and the disempowerment of parents in the raising of their own children. I mean, all of this was well known before, but they finally said, it's bad. Right, and we should do something about it. Of course, then you had, this is 1928, then you had the Great Depression. Then you had World War II. And it's really not until after World War II that they start really dismantling residential boarding schools. In fact, my, my grandmother went to residential boarding school. And uh, when she did, her mother actually told her, we are so destitute that you're at least going to get three hops in a cot there. So let's roll our dice and send you. And that was there. That was what went down with my own grandmother when she was sent to school during that time period. BIA boarding schools today, sometimes it surprises people that there are still Bureau of Indian Affairs residential boarding schools in operation today. There are. There are four of them. Uh, but most of them were dismantled. Santa Fe was turned over to control of Pueblo Indians, it's actually a culture-based uh, K-12 magnet school in Santa Fe. Haskell has actually been converted now to the campus of the only all Native American university in the United States. Uh, Chilico and Phoenix were closed in the Reagan administration. There's still a few in operation, but they have been reformed. They're not beating people up for speaking their tribal languages. 
but even the fact that they still exist as a vestigial remnant of this policy <coughs> to me seems kind of crazy. There were unintended consequences, right? This whole policy was designed to assimilate people and make them more like all other Americans. But all of a sudden, and by the way, this happened, the founding members of the National Congress of American Indians and many of the founding members of the American Indian Movement were people who had suffered together in residential boarding schools. So you had this kind of rise in pan-Indian sentiment. Even tribes that in former times might have waged war against one another all of a sudden said, you know what, we got a bigger enemy. And we got a bigger problem. And we got more in common. So it, it resulted in a rise in pan-Indian sentiment. A greater sense of not assimilation into America, but alienation from America. Distrust for the government. Distrust for educators. A heightened sense of otherness. That's them. That's the man trying to keep you down. Oops, I went the wrong way. In the United States, the grandparent generation is pretty much, most of them have been through the system, sometimes as many as three generations before them. In Canada, the system started later and ended more recently. But you had generations of native people who had lang their own tribal languages beaten out of them. The roots of the identity issues that we face, dysfunction, if you want to call it that, substance abuse, are directly tied to this policy. Language loss, directly tied to this policy. There were around 500 tribal languages spoken in North America at the time of contact with Columbus. I mean, there's other contacts, too, and that's another story. But today there are around 183 still spoken. Sometimes that surprises people that there are that many, but there are. But only 20 of those are spoken by any number of children. So within your lifetimes, unless there is an act of God or something, you will see 163 languages in the United States and Canada go extinct. Of those 20 that are still spoken by children, there are really only about four that have large, vibrant populations of speakers. Ojibwe, by the way, is one of those languages. There are, uh, there's a cluster of communities in the Severn region in Ontario where there's 100% fluency. And then actually right on the Minnesota-Ontario uh, border, the community uh, there, Lac Lacroix, actually has 100% fluency in the tribal language. So there are places where the population of speakers is growing as the population grows, but that is the exception and not the rule. We're down to around a thousand speakers of Ojibwe in the United States, just on this side of the border. And some of those communities, it's pretty scary what's going on. It doesn't look good for some dialects of Ojibwe. Diné is quite vibrant, Cree, but even in those places, we're worried. We're worried everywhere. And it's no longer the case that there has to be a colonial regime to stamp out a language. As soon as you get electricity in a road and the satellite starts pumping English language into every house in the, in the village, language. Right? These are just some statistic charts about where we're at with languages and language fluency. Some of the other impacts include indigenous attitudes about education. There is still, in Indian country, a very widely held belief that getting an education means getting whitewashed. I got that. <coughs> Ooh, big college boy going to Princeton. <laughs> that means you're an apple. You're just red on the outside. You're white on the inside. Got it constantly. Constantly. Something that's different, I think, compared to the experience of many other people, although there are parallels for other people of color, but also something different about it. There is still a widely held belief, very widely held, that education means assimilation. There is still a widely held distrust of educators, school officials, politicians. I think you can understand why the distrust might be. 
I do a lot of teacher trainings, and one of the things that happens is this. There'll be a teacher there uh, who's saying, look, we just got, got targeted under No Child Left Behind for AYP consequences, meaning, are you guys familiar with No Child Left Behind? You know, it, highly problematic government policy, which basically says you got to teach <coughs> two subject areas, you know, math and reading. And everything else is of much less significance, and you have to get kids to test out at a certain benchmark. The, the big problems are that if you bring a kid from the first grade reading level to an 11th grade reading level in one year, but the kid's actually in the 12th grade, that teacher just failed. So it doesn't measure progress, it measures achievement. But anyway, so I'll get some teachers like, you know, we got a lot of native kids in our school district and we just got hit with no child left behind stuff and, you know, we're going to be forced with some really draconian measures here. What, what should we do? I mean, I'm a teacher. I don't know why they want to demonize me, but you got a truancy problem. You get those kids to school, I will teach them. You get them to school not, I cannot teach them. It's really that simple. And we have parent-teacher conferences. And those native parents never show up. We have a family fun night. They never show up. What do I do? Now, there are a lot of things that, in that situation, even the very best of teachers might not fully realize. I mean, in native communities, people are having 4.4 kids per household instead of 1.2 kids per household. A much higher rate of single parent families and of young single mothers raising kids or of grandparents raising the kids in a foster care situation. So, some of this is demographics, but some of this is that grandma or the parents, if they were not directly beaten by their teachers for speaking the only language they knew, at least know family members who work. Why do the parents not show up at parent-teacher conferences? Damn, it's uncomfortable. It's hard to trust teachers or educational institutions given all of this history. There are all these societal pressures and perspectives that need to be taken into consideration. And I think the problem with a lot of those turnaround plans is that doing the same dang thing that we've been doing all these years, just doing it harder, is not going to get us there. We have to change what we're actually doing. And, like it or not, the truth of the matter is, it's not working. I've got to update this stuff because we just got our 2010 <coughs> census data. But just about any major indication for native success in education, it's bad. Achievement rates, graduation rates, matriculation rates for <laughs> colleges and universities. And I'll kind of blaze through this, but again, if you want the statistics, they're easy to get. There's another book called Indians in Minnesota, which just choose, they come out with a new issue every 10 years, trailing behind the census data, and they're really good at, at kind of laying it all out for you, useful. Uh, so after they start dismantling residential boarding schools, well then there's day schools. And those day schools had lots of problems too. The benefits were that kids got to live at home. Right? So there was, it became easier to maintain family relationships and things like that. Most of them did not maintain uniforms, but most still had a very strict English language policy. In fact, there was just a case uh, in the Menominee schools over at uh, by Kashina, where there was a native girl speaking in the Menominee language in the school and the teacher um, disciplined the student and suspended her, uh, saying that she was being lippy and mouthy and, and whatnot. But she was just saying something in Menominee. Sometimes kids are being suspended for long hair or different learning styles might be interpreted differently. Like I was always told, when there is somebody older than you speaking, you give them all your respect. You put your head down and you listen. And there is a teacher, when I'm talking, you look at me. Like, oh. But no way to understand that or account for that. 
And then, of course, there's the curriculum, right? We have so much work to do. All you get about Native people is a sugar-coated version of Christopher Columbus and the first Thanksgiving. <laughs> That's it. But the version of Columbus is really messed up. If you look at Bartolome de las Casas and his writings, what was really happening on Columbus's uh, second voyage to the Americas, this is a drawing from the first English edition for um, Bar Bartolome de las Casas' book in defense of the Indians. And it just simply depicts the gold dust tribute that the Spanish instituted. They said all native people need to bring a hawk's bell, basically a quarter teaspoon of gold dust, um, at the island of Española, what's now Haiti and the Dominican Republic. Those who fail to do so will have their hands chopped off. Well, they chopped the hands off of two million, or of, of 30,000 people there. The indigenous population of Española, which was estimated at two million people by the Spanish, was reduced to around 15,000 just in a, in a decade or so. And the remaining population absorbed into the general Spanish-speaking population after that. <coughs> that was genocide. And those are Spanish figures, not some inflated figures by some New Age scientist that everyone's going to quibble with. That's what De Las Casas and what Columbus estimated happened to the indigenous population on that one island in the Caribbean. Columbus made no excuses. The only battles going on amongst the Spaniards were whether or not natives were actually humans, as De Las Casas believed, humans who had souls and should be converted to Christianity and then enslaved, or Columbus who said they don't even have souls but enslaved them. Those are the arguments that were going on. Columbus kept copious notes, journals, all this stuff so well documented. And the biggest question for me is not about what happened, which is obvious. The biggest question is, why are we teaching it like this? Indians! Chris! In 1492, Chris Columbus sailed the ocean blue. He discovered the new world. I mean, how can you discover a place that's densely inhabited by other human beings? It's a pretty good question. And this raises a fundamental issue with the way we teach, with the way we do our politics. And I'm so sorry if I'm the first one telling you that I think your teachers may have lied to you. Probably because your teachers were lied to, too. It may not even be as insidious as the fact that, you know, they're trying to teach you wrong. I think most teachers I've met are, are horrified at the idea of being accused of racism or of getting something wrong. Very few exceptions to that. But look at, I mean, you can't read this. I'm going to flip to the next one. But this is a statement by George Bush the Elder back in... 1992 on our 500th anniversary. And I won't read this whole thing, but just look at the, the highlighted words. Momentous year in history, greatest achievements of human endeavor, discovery of the new world, set an example for us all. I mean, hmm. an example that was followed, sure. Not one I want my kids to follow. Set an example for us all. Monumental feats, perseverance, faith, support the quincentenary. Holy crap, after 500 years, is it that hard to say, hey, part of our history is that this land was founded on genocidal policies towards native people, towards the enslavement of black people. Those things are morally repugnant, and I'm actually saying that because I love my country. Why is it so hard to say that? I mean, no individual human being wants to look at the ugly chapters in their, his in their own personal <sighs> lives. I don't want to be judged by my darkest day. No nation wants to be judged by its darkest day either. But dang, when we have dark days, we need to own them. And make them right. Went to Germany and Austria, and I wanted to see some concentration camps. Right? Went to Dachau, outside the city of Munich. No road signs. Until you're about a kilometer away. One sign. 
went to Mauthausen in Austria. Austria had joined Germany with the Anschluss early in World War II and had culpability in the final solution. So I went looking for Mauthausen. No road signs. Right here about two kilometers away. Go look, go look for uh, Auschwitz in Poland. 200 kilometers away, 175, 150, 50, 25, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Look what the Nazis did to us. It's not that the history wasn't important in some places and was more important in others. It was that the Germans were quite understandably ashamed. And to deal with that, to understand how the most well-educated and the most literate society in the world came up with the Holocaust is a fine question. And to deal with that, the Germans had to you know, make reparations from banks that, you know, were minting the fillings out of Holocaust victims. They had to mandate instruction about it in their educational system and make formal apologies. Well, here in America, we have yet to get two formal apologies. Reparations. Much less, and much more importantly, educating about them. And it is the continued ignorance which we all have been forced to endure that enables the continuation of things like white privilege or 85% unemployment at Pine Ridge or any number of other horrific ongoing disasters in Indian country. Education really is the key. And how are we to overcome this major gap for Native communities where education has been and continues to be about assimilation? It is still about assimilation. All right. I'm going to, in the interest of time, I'm going to speed this up. I'll show you a couple things here. By the way, this is the great seal for the territory of Wisconsin. And Minnesota and Wisconsin were the same territory for a long time until they split them apart and started making them into states. It's a little hard to see, but there's an image of an Indian here with his feathers in his hair, getting on a steamship heading west. The Ho-Chunk, otherwise known as Winnebago Indians, were forcibly relocated. They actually had nine separate removal orders, but were forcibly relocated down the Mississippi and up the Missouri to Santee, Nebraska, by steamship. So this image is, is there. You got the white farmer, industriously plowing the land. You've got the state capital looming in the background. And it's a shame that you guys don't get to learn Latin, but the caption in Latin says it all. Civilization succeeds barbarism. So it is not just the case that we are ashamed of and hide from all these ugly chapters. Sometimes we celebrate them. Winners write the history books like it's a good thing. Not only who's writing the book, but you want to be the winner. Right? Whose heroes do we study? You know, Washington, Lincoln, Grant, Jackson. Each one of these individuals personally killed Indians and engineered policies that were genocidal to Native people. The architects of American democracy, our constitution and rule of law. But when you look at these things from a native perspective, well, heck, my heroes are not your heroes. You look at what happened in Mankato, you're going to be seeing a lot about U.S.-Dakota conflict back in 1862 because we're coming up to the sesquicentennial and the largest mass execution in U.S. history. And that was Lincoln who signed that order. Right before his Emancipation Proclamation, human beings are complicated. Yep. Well, <clears throat> I have been so a historian, now, but Lincoln did pardon about um, over two hundred. Right. They started out with a list of over three hundred people, and they reduced it down once, you know, to a hundred or so, and then again to the thirty-eight. 
again, I mean, we could spend the whole hour just talking about this one event in history. Um, but there was tremendous injustice done. I grant you, Lincoln was in a tough spot too, you know. And you got to evaluate people by the situation around them and their times. But I don't think any of these guys are beyond any kind of criticism. And I think the great danger is in either romanticizing or demonizing anybody. I think we need to look at the whole complicated history. Or you look at the broken treaties. I mean, shouldn't great human beings like great nations keep their word? And vice versa. I'm not even going to talk about Thanksgiving. But there's a lot of ugly stuff to talk about there too. By the way, just, I mean, there's a lot to say to that story, but the uh, one of the chiefs of the Wampanoag had his head put on a pike outside the village of Plymouth for 20 years. There's a lot more to that story, but I encourage you to look at it. There's a lot more about origins, how people actually got to this continent. It's really a fascinating, fascinating subject. But just think, for example, how it would feel or what the reaction should be to people who are told one thing by their elders and in their ceremonies and by their families at home and to hear something totally dismissive or opposite at school, regardless of who's right or wrong. <coughs> Schools provide a lot of opportunities for us to learn about white culture, history, and heroes. But very few to learn about Native American history, culture, heroes. And that's a big part of the disconnect. It's not the intent of those who design curriculum or teach to out anybody or to marginalize others, but it is the effect. Being told, here are the great cultures of the world, not yours. The great actors in world history, not yours. The great ideas, not yours. Eventually builds up a profound blow to self-esteem. To me, that is at the very heart of the achievement gap. That achievement gap, it's an opportunity gap. Let's call it what it is. Native kids aren't any dumber than anybody else. But they are provided fewer opportunities to learn about themselves than most anybody else. Even in school districts that are 100% Native kids, but have almost 100% non-Native staff, like Red Lake, Cass Lake, many of the reservation schools up north. It's incredible. So many issues to look at. Here's Ronald Reagan. We were wrong to let Indians have reservations. We should have done more to bring them into the fold of American life. I remember. And regardless of your personal political persuasions, how are Native Americans supposed to embrace the country that dismisses all of that history and tells them something like that? Leech Lake, where I'm from, has a real gerrymandering issue. That reservation isn't even 40 miles across by about 30 miles north to south. It's broke, there are 7,000 native people living there. It's broken up into several school districts and several voting districts. So native people have never been able to gain representation on the school boards that are educating the kids even in the native majority schools. And all the talk about redistricting was about, that we just went through, was all about not putting two incumbents in the same election to run against one another. And no thought to any of this stuff. Not that we didn't raise the issues. It's a chicken or the egg thing too. You know, it's, there are few native people to serve as administrators and educators, especially those with the degrees. And then without the role models and without the different perspectives, and then how are you going to really make headways with the kids who are dropping out and not 
going on to become teachers and administrators and so forth. It's tough to break that cycle. There's this perspective that in spite of things like an 85% unemployment rate over at Pine Ridge or whatever, that Indians are all rich from casinos. Because you hear all about, you know, all about Shakopee, <coughs> which is 250 of the 2 million Indians in North America. And everyone judges the entire native population by that. And so it's even drying up grant monies and things like that because everyone has this assumption. The tribes are doing a lot of things. They're native education associations. One of the great ironies is that a place like Bemidji State University, for example, might be one of your best places to relearn your language if you didn't happen to grow up with it. And we're starting to get that word out there, I think. There are uh, some pretty exciting educational initiatives, and I'm going to skip ahead on a couple of these things just to, to get to the close here, but uh, we have a lot of challenges. I'm going to skip through a couple of these things and talk about this one. There's an Ojibwe immersion school in uh, Hayward, Wisconsin, and they're a charter school, so they're chartered out of the public school district. About half of the native kids in the United States are failing their state-mandated tests in English and math. About half are failing. So it's abysmal. There are some schools with a lot of native kids that are making AYP No Child Left Behind, including a couple tribal schools. They're the exceptions, though not the rule. But over here in Hayward, Wisconsin, half the kids were flunking their tests in the public school system and also in the tribal school. So they said, we're going to do an Ojibwe immersion school, meaning we will use the Ojibwe language as the only language of instruction. It'll be the medium of instruction. So they did. And probably one of the most telling statistics about that school is that for 12 years in a row, they have had a 100% pass rate on their state mandated tests in English, administered in English. Now you can talk about all the things going wrong, but if somebody's doing something right, holy crap, we should all pay attention. Somebody did something right. Consistently. For 12 years in a row now. And they have to meet all state mandated curriculum guidelines, just like everybody else in the state of Wisconsin. But they're doing it in a different way. So they're taking the kids out to the lake to go pick rice, and they're saying, measure the contents of this birch bark canoe. Have you ever tried to do that? That's hard. All right? So they're doing their science, they're doing their math, they're calculating things out, they're filling it full of water, they're pouring it into canisters, and they're comparing content levels, and then they're going to pick rice in the Ojibwe custom. And they're bringing it back, and they're processing it, and they're talking about the science, and they're talking about the culture, and all of a sudden the parents are coming there, and they want to volunteer and help out at the school, and they don't distrust their educators so much, and all of a sudden, something's working. You can think about it this way, with any kid, any kid, any race, whatever. <clears throat> We're looking for the one thing that will keep them interested and involved in everything. For one kid, that might be music. For another one, it might be sports, whatever. But for Native kids, language and culture does do that. It builds positive self-esteem, and that translates into success in everything across the curriculum. Other schools and places have been doing that. There's one in Minnesota, uh, Nigane, which is on the Leech Lake Reservation. The Hawaiians, the Maori, have been going at it the longest. The Maori are really exciting for me. And one, and one of the other exciting things is that, by the way, the Maori had very similar demographic issues to what we have here in the sense that, you know, there were high uh, rates of poverty, of substance abuse, believe it or not, higher rates of participation in gangs and gang-related violence. But now, they've been going at it so long Communities there that used to seem so angry at the rest of the world compete with one another over who can prove to be the most hospitable to visitors. You will receive overwhelming hospitality. You can sense the pride, not just when they're doing a haka or something like that, but you can see even precipitous declines in the rate of participation in gangs. Wow. 
Wow. I mean, everybody else is scratching their heads, whatever racial group they're looking at, trying to figure out how do we get a solution to that. <coughs> I pay attention. Language revitalization, this is stuff I just shared with you, it does that. There's so much to share with you about language. I'm just going to blaze ahead, but we've got, you know, it impacts very identity. A lot of things impact identity, right? Your race, your blood, uh, the place where you're from, your culture, the things you do every day, and language. It impacts sovereignty. What makes France a sovereign nation is having a land that is France and a language that is French, and a Frenchman can be French, even if he's traveling in China because of his connection to those things. That's part of why it should be important for us, too. That was one of my little guys, by the way. The roots of words speak to the deeper meanings within them. I'll give you one example here. Mindemuye. That means a, a female elder. Literally, it means one who holds things together. And it describes the role of the family matriarch. Now, in English, you've got old woman, elder woman, aged woman... And no wonder everybody won't admit how old they really are. Wants a facelift and a Botox injection and a hair dye. And how many elders do you see on the cover of Cosmo? So language holds values, a different perspective or way of looking at the world, and vice versa. And some of these other languages, which are fading so fast, and most people are like, oh, I guess it's sad we won't be hearing that bird in the forest, aren't realizing that so much more could be lost. Perspective on gender, on race, on the human condition, on spirituality, the very ideas that might be essential to save us all. It's not just a bird, bird in the forest. It's so much more. We have so many issues to overcome, everything from funding and resources to English-only laws, by the way, which were just introduced in Minnesota this past fall. I had to call around and start talking to my legislators. I didn't get any traction talking about the issues as they affect us. But finally did when I started talking about my Norwegian farmer neighbor or our Minnesota state seal with its caption in French, L'Etoile du Nord. So you'll have to take that down and put up home of monolingual cultural imperialists or something. <laughs> this world is horribly, unconscionably unfair. And anybody who believes that, you know, you can simply rise on your own merits or that the world is fair has never been, you know, to Darfur, has never watched the news, has no idea about how things really work. Sometimes a little baby dies. Sometimes a really mean and awful person can live a long life. This world's unfair. Fair or not, if there's anything we want as individuals or as a people, then we have to make it so. And so, if that's sobriety, mental or physical health, <coughs> land, culture, language, it might be unfair, but we have to reclaim those things for ourselves. And we have to think about this. It's not just the man keeping us down. It's not just the machine keeping us down. It's not just these horrible, oppressive, you know, systems, isms, capitalism. It's us. It's our own choices, the own agency that we have to exercise. Whether you're Indian or white or whatever, we make choices about how we live, about what we do. And we need to acknowledge everything that's been destroyed as part of the healing process in dealing with historical trauma, but we also need to build things. I was talking to the Seminole, and uh, they've done everything that most of our tribal leadership is trying to do. They've successfully eliminated poverty for their entire citizen. They have so much money, they bought the entire Hard Rock Cafe enterprise across the world. And when there was a big budget shortfall in the state of Florida, 
for their education system, they wrote a check. Bottom, lots of love. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, sir. We are so appreciative, sir. Of course, there will be no state proliferation of gaming here in Florida, sir. I would be happy to bring you with me when I go to the governor's meeting with President Obama, sir. And I will make sure that your voice is the loudest one there, sir. But if you ask the Seminole, as they were climbing, like all these tribal leaders, climbing that mountain of political power and economic prosperity, what keeps you up at night? They all say, language and culture laws. And this is my fear, when I'm, especially when I'm speaking to tribal people, is that we are exerting so much energy, climbing that mountain of economic prosperity and political empowerment, sovereignty. They're going to get to the top and look around and go, oh my God, we just climbed the wrong mountain. We should have been working on language and culture revitalization when we had the chance. And the same thing for all of us, regardless of our race, gender, or the country of our origin. You know, you look at what we are doing, climbing, pursuing financial issues, money, the extraction of fossil fuels. And I think we have the same issue going on, going on here. And once every last drop of oil has been eked out and they finally converted us over to something else, there'll be something else to mine somewhere else. You know? But what's lost along the way is a very sense of self, a moral compass. And I guarantee you, you know, Mother Earth will get by just fine without its 7 billion human inhabitants. We can't do a darn thing without Mother Earth. And I just hope that the realizations don't come too late. Well, there's a lot of things here. I guess I'll just focus on this one over here. But, you know, if we embrace a culture of violence and disconnection from our Earth Mother that has been thrust upon us for 2,000 plus years, well, then maybe we deserve to wallow in existential angst, fruitless quests to find a meaning in our existence, and the very real threat of a human-engineered apocalypse. Maybe we should question the things that are destroying our planet, or the ways of thinking, the belief systems that can show us a different way. I don't feel all gloom and doom. And I'll, sh I'll, uh, I'll share one story about this crazy white guy in Bemidji <laughs> named Michael Muirs, who, without any money, has completely changed that entire town. He said, you know, when I go to Hawaii and someone says aloha, everyone on this planet knows what that means. So he basically started a grassroots effort to say, Let's rename this town. And let's put up bilingual signage in Ojibwe and in English. And they did. It didn't <coughs> cost a penny. They now have the university, the hospital, the public school system, the regional events center, and the vast majority of businesses in town with bilingual signage. And all of a sudden, Indians are kind of feeling distrustful and wondering why there isn't an affirmative action employment policy there, are feeling a little more welcome. I was just paying my bill at my mechanic, and my mechanic says, uh, how me wage get go and me no one? I said, wow, I mean, he never took an Ojibwe class. And so, kind of spinning off from this, the university's been busy, we've been putting up posters and audio flashcards and all kinds of stuff, and that town is so different than the town that I grew up in. It's really changed a lot. One guy, one simple idea, building some bridges and making something happen, and there are so many great ideas. All right. Indians have kept for everybody some earth-based cultural perspectives I believe necessary for all of us to survive. A toolbox full of knowledge about how to survive, not just in a harsh landscape like this, 
but about spiritual processes necessary to do that. I think it's possible to look at America's treatment of American Indians, see what's wrong with it, see how devastating the consequences were, and to learn from and use those lessons. Pick up some pieces, find a collective moral compass, stop exploiting resources of the planet or of one another. Margaret Mead said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. All right, miigwech. Questions? I know that was long, but um, I'm happy to take some questions. There's free flyers in the back there. If you want to grab some on your way out, you can Facebook me, follow on Twitter, send me an email. I'm happy to keep in touch. And then I'll come back there if anyone's interested in buying books. Yeah. Um, I guess going back to the education thing, you kind of said uh, Indians have incorporated their sense of culture and language, and it's really helped the education process. Uh, I get the sense that in America, we, we're such like a melting pot. A lot of us, it just seems like the culture has just kind of dissipated its cheeseburgers and everything we eat out. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it, do you think that we would have to rebuild a sense of an American culture that's beaver, or is there some way to like bring it back, our roots? Kind of? I think both are possible. Um, yeah, it has been the American experience to disconnect from motherland disconnect from mother tongue. And although there have been immigrant groups that have tried and worked very hard to maintain those things, you know, some have kind of gone Amish, right, and succeeded that way. Others have maintained things in different ways. Um, you know, it's a challenge to be sure. But I think connecting to place really matters. You know, like the community of Panema, for example, is just you know, if there's a death in the community, the tribal government stops all operations, closes all public offices, you know, lowers their flags. Somebody from every single family cooks food and brings it to the funeral, not just because they often knew the person, but because they're from the same community. And I think those kinds of community, you know, can transcend race, you know, gender, and other things. And I think working on that level can be really productive. I mean, I had a sense of community in that example I shared with you with my Norwegian neighbor. Even though he's operating in a totally different language, the fact that he was valuing a different language spoke that way. And we communicated very well. And I, when our house burned down one time, he, he and his wife were over there with their casserole and their pie, you know, Minnesota style. And, uh, but there was a sense of connection there. And I think those kinds of humanistic things are, are things to point to and work towards. And frankly, you know, like the Native Hawaiians, their language and cultural revitalization efforts have involved many non-Hawaiian people. And they've gone from 500 speakers to around 12,000. And, and a significant number are non-Hawaiian by blood. And I don't see any reason why everybody can't participate in the things that find and bring meaning. And when you look at, you know, even something like, whether it's the 1862 stuff, or if it's the Columbus story or whatever, there is liberation for everybody in understanding the truth of that history. It's not just to beat people up at heart, to feel angry, and to feel guilty. And those are completely unproductive emotions. So the key is to take that first emotive response and translate it into action, right? I mean, some dude goes out and cheats on his wife, you know, and wants to reconcile the relationship. Well, you can't change what happened, but you also can't just say, hey, that all happened in the past, just forget about it, right? If you want to reconcile that relationship, it's got to start with, I am so sorry, and I, I have done you wrong, and it's never going to happen again. And then you got, you know, your 10% chance to reconcile that relationship. Well, we need our 10% chance. And to me, it needs to start with something like that. You know, it's imperfect. You're never going to please everybody. 
But in the places that have embraced, you know, not the ideas of assimilation, but the ideas of tolerating and supporting things like linguistic and cultural diversity, the bridge building has been really profound. I, I, that's why I think Arizona is totally screwed up. <laughs> they are. They're also the only state that turned down honoring Martin Luther King Day, too. I like what Chris Rock had to say. He said, how racist do you have to be to turn down...